Welcome to the Story of My Pet podcast. I'm your host, Julie Marty Pearson. It was my passion for animals that fueled me to start this podcast, and I'm so glad you're here to join me along the way. Today, we'll hear from another guest telling their tales of their amazing pets from yesterday and today. We'll be able to talk about rescue and adoption and so much more about our amazing animal friends. Don't forget to stick around at the end to hear about the organization we're highlighting in today's episode. Hello, 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 my friends and fellow animal lovers. Welcome to the Story of My Pet podcast. I am Julie Marty Pearson, your host as always, and I'm here for another exciting and interesting episode with my guest, Lois. Lois, thank you so much for being here. It is great to be with you, and some of my dogs are around in the house, so they may pop in and out um, <laughs> audibly as we're recording this. So yes. just letting you know that ahead of time. All, all, all breeds and um, types of people are welcome to join us. I think <laughs> I would say we encourage that here. <laughs> <laughs> That's great to know. Yes. Um, so before we get started, I'm going to tell our listeners a little bit more about you. So Lois is a disability advocate, a professional speaker, author of six books, a blogger, podcaster, sometimes rock musician, exciting, and an intensely grateful guide dog owner. She became blind at the age of 21 as a result of diabetes. She lives in Cape Town, South Africa with her husband and a house full of dogs. That's amazing. All of whom clearly understand that they run the humans, not the other way around. <laughs> and yeah. As I mentioned, she has a podcast that is called A Different Way of Seeing, and she has several books, but um, there are one on Amazon right now that you can actually get a free download that we will give you the link for. It's called Pause for Thought, Seeing the World Through the Eyes of a Guide Dog. Amazing. Welcome again so much, Lois. Thank you for being here. It's great to be here with you all the way from Cape Town. So yes, it's amazing. You are the third um, guest, not sure what order they will come out in, but at this <laughs> point, who I've spoken to in another country. Um, oh. I had someone in Ireland, some, someone in Australia, and now you. It's amazing. The reach of the love of pets. Well, I think it's it's one of the things, you know, a love of animals, the the connection with animals is truly universal. It's something that we can all relate to. And I think that is, it's just a really special relationship. Absolutely. So um, for you, I know you want to, you know, really focus on the importance and the value and your experience having a guide dog. Um, so at what point in your, um, in your life, what, um, was having a guide dog, um, when did it come into your life <laughs> to be able to have a service dog? I became blind at the age of 21. And at the time I was studying at university, I was living in a shared accommodation with a number of other students. And that really wasn't, con it just wouldn't have worked for me to have had a guide dog. Right. And when I moved from the city I was living in at the time, which was in Durban on the east coast of South Africa, I then moved to Cape Town, where my, my father and stepmom were living. And I started thinking about starting to work and moving into a place of my own. It suddenly made sense to me that a guide dog might really add to my independence. Uh, I'm, I, I mean, I, I am totally comfortable using a white mobility cane, and they do provide a, a lot of independence. Right. But for me, I've always grown up with animals. I've always loved and had dogs around me, and the thought of having a a, a guide dog companion with me was just so amazing. So right. I was about. 25 maybe 26 okay when I got my first guide dog who was a little black Labrador named Layla oh and she was 15 months when she started working now you think about most Labradors at 15 months and they're going through the 
chewing, digging, yes. uh, garden destroying, furniture destroying phase. And by then she was already a qualified guide dog mm. and a very serious and very focused guide dog. And I worked with her for, she was about 10 when she retired. Wow. And by then I had just started working with a, a new guide dog, a young Labrador cross of the Golden Retriever, whose name was Eccles. Aww. And she was 20 months when I got her. She was a totally different dog, yes. but also a great worker. And then Eccles worked until she was about 11 years old, which is unusual. Okay. But my lifestyle, it just, you know, I, I stopped working. Um, I started working on my own and I was working from home and it just didn't, mm. At the time, it didn't make sense because I wasn't certain how much I'd be out and about. So right. I didn't put my name on the list to get a, a replacement guide dog. And then a little while later, well, there's quite a story about how I got to um, my, my third and current guide dog, Fiji. Okay. Um, my husband and I travel quite a lot. And we traveled to Greece. And in Greece, one of the ancient sites is, is called Delphi. And that's yes. where the Delphic Oracle used to give out advice about the future. And all okay. sorts of the Greek legends talk about getting advice from the Delphic Oracle. And we were walking around the ruins of Delphi. And a dog ran up to me and grabbed my white cane and tried to run away with it. Oh, my. <laughs> And I laughingly turned to my husband and said, well, maybe the Delphic Oracle is telling me that it's time to pack in my cane because I'm getting my new dog. Yes, that's amazing. And a few weeks after we returned home, I had a phone call asking me if I was available to go on training with my new dog. That's just amazing. It was amazing. And I mean, we laughed oh. about it at the time, but it was just right. one of those things. And obviously each of the dogs that I've worked with as a guide dog, they've been totally different. They've all been really fantastic in their own ways, but they all still are dogs right. with their own unique personalities, their own quirks, their own strengths, their own idiosyncrasies. And it's, it's been such a joy to, to work with the dogs. And then, of course, because I love dogs so much, and if you can hear him. Yes, I just heard him. <laughs> that's that's our, our, our newest um, pup. That's Onyx. Uh, he's ah. feeling very upset because he's waiting for his dad to come home with the guide dog. Because they're out <laughs> for the moment. And Onyx does feel very upset if he's left at home. Oh, so, He doesn't um, like to be left out. He doesn't. And there's a whole story, which I'm sure we'll get to about Onyx and how we got him. He himself is partially sighted. Oh, okay. And he is a rescue, um, but he came into our, our family less than a year ago. So. Oh, okay. That's yeah. amazing. But So, so yeah. F Fiji, what type of dog is she? Fiji is a yellow Labrador crossed okay. with a golden retriever. In fact, her father is a black labrador um, he's one of the breeding dogs and he is actually american mm. and fiji's mom is a golden retriever whose name is fiesta and i actually oh. know um, fiesta's human mom mm -hmm. and i also know one of the women who has one of fiji's siblings who also went into the guide dogs breeding program oh. here in South Africa. And that's a dog named Faith, who was Fiji's best friend when they were growing up. Oh, so, that's amazing. Yeah. It's always great when we have those connections to family, even for our pets. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the guide dogs, particularly, well, I can only really talk for the South African community, but it's a really strong community. Yes. And I have a lot of connections with the puppy walkers who look after the pups from the time they're born to when they go into full time training uh, with other guide dog owners. We're a real community. In fact, it's almost a joke that we might not know each other's names, 
but we're almost certainly going to know each other's guide dog's name. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, but I mean, I've, we've, I've got four dogs at home at the moment, and uh, it's a big, happy family. Two of them are rescue dogs. Our, our oldest dog, who's actually sitting next to me at the moment, is a 12-year-old retriever named Emily. Aww. And then Fiji is seven and a half. She turns eight in August. And then our two rescues, Ali and Onyx. And they come from different rescue organizations here in Cape Town. Okay. Um, and Ali joined us about three years ago now. And she totally changed our life. And it was really about a year ago that we started realizing that there was a, a bit of a gap in the family that needed a fourth dog. And ah. that was when we got Onyx. That's amazing. Yeah. That sounds like an amazing family. I gain so much from being surrounded by, by the pups. And they, they, I don't have human children, but we do have fur children. We always have had. Yes. And, you know, I said there are kind of origin stories about how each of them came into our lives. So maybe I can tell you a few of those as we go on. That would be and, great. Yeah, that, I think just talking about all of them and, and then maybe Fiji a little bit specifically um, right. as the guide dog and particularly about the book that she wrote. Well, technically, she and I wrote it together. Ah, that's and amazing. A bit about that as well. Yeah. No, that's amazing. I too am um, a fur mom. I do not have Cuban <laughs> children. And it's so funny. It's something I posted today on Facebook is that families come in all shapes, sizes, and breeds. Yes. And, um, you know, there's so many women who, for whatever reason, whether they can't or they choose not to have human children, um, and we often gravitate towards the animal children and, you know, it gives us that same sense of family and unconditional love and, and support. And I think that's so important. It's something I, I really am promoting with the purpose of this podcast. Absolutely. So yeah. let's, let's talk a little bit more about Fiji. Well, how did she do in her training? I don't really know much about her actual training uh, obviously I, I, I know what the trainers have told me and I do Fiji and I do a fair amount of work with the South African Guide Dogs Association in terms of advocacy and public speaking and things like that mm -hmm. so Fiji was actually born in Johannesburg which okay. is where the head office of the Guide Dogs um, for the Blind Center is in mm -hmm. South Africa and most of the training takes place there but okay. they do have a secondary subsidiary training center here in Cape Town as well and of my three dogs Fiji was the first one that I actually was trained in Cape Town oh okay so the first time I met Fiji I was sitting in my room at the guide dogs training center because you, you go for a, a two-week training program there where you you meet the dog you learn to work with the dog I honestly I think in that time it's more about training the humans than the dogs because <laughs> the dogs are pretty much trained by then right they they've been training they for a long do. time <laughs> yes it's the humans who need to catch up right so yeah it, it's it's pretty much about training the humans but you you get to learn to work with the dog and you start developing the bond right. that is so essential for effective working with a guide and a human Absolutely. so the first time thing I, I i reckon when i heard of fiji was this little tap 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 of little <laughs> paws coming down the corridor with wooden floors so i could hear her nails on the floor and the trainer cheryl brought her into the room and she introduced me and said you know this is fiji she's 18 months old she's a pale yellow labrador cross with a, a gold a lab cross with a golden retriever mm -hmm. And, and she's your new guide dog. And Fiji kind of looked at me and went, yeah, hi. But this room is so interesting. I need to go and sniff around and explore because this is so much fun. So, yes, 
Yes. And it was, I mean, obviously, because they don't have a bond with you when you first meet them. Right. And that first hour or so was me trying to attract my dog's attention. And she was like, yes, 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 you're nice. And I'll come play with you now. But I just want to sniff this corner. Yes. And it was a little <laughs> bit like that. And I was kind of like, hmm. How's but, this going to go? <laughs> yes. And the, the, you know, just in comparison, my first guide dog, Layla, had been so excited to meet me. And we started playing almost immediately. My second guide dog, Eccles, met me, turned her nose up at me, lay down with her back to me and went to sleep. Oh, oh so my goodness. Fiji was somewhere in between, which at least was an improvement on Eccles. Yes. And I will say Eccles and I did bond very quickly after that initial meeting. Yes. And Fiji and I were the same as well. And I think dogs, they kind of know people who love dogs and engage with dogs and they are yep. always happy to to engage back exactly so we, and, when we started, and of course that whole the whole point of you going to the guide dog school for those weeks to train yeah. is like you said it's connecting that bond if they just brought the yes. dog to you and dropped her off that would be a very different scenario well, so they, they do a degree of what they call domicilium training where they train people in their home environment but even then they're not just going to drop the dog and leave absolutely there's a whole process that you go through to train you and your new guide in the routes that you're going to be using around your home around your work around you know just around your general environment if you need to get to the shops if you need to get to the closest vet everything right. like that they never are going to just leave you right. to figure that out on your own well and I and, think that's important for people to understand mm. who maybe don't know enough about service dogs guide dogs that you know when we call them working dogs they are working dogs from you know the time they're puppies they're already being trained and they're learning and they continue to learn as they meet you know their person as they you know, experience new environments, you know, that's, that's a part of who they are and a part of their job, which is ongoing. Absolutely. But at the same time, they are still dogs. Yes. And I mean, I, I've always with the when I first applied for a guide dog, one of the questions on the application form was, is there any particular breed or any particular type of dog that you would like not that we guarantee you're going to get it but just just so we know right and my response was I want a dog that will keep me on my toes <laughs> and I can pretty much tell you that each one of my guide dogs has lived up to that that's amazing <laughs> yeah so my, my first guide dog Layla introduced me to my husband oh my second guide dog spent a lot of time traveling with me around South Africa, um, doing work with Toastmasters International. I was part of the leadership team in Southern African Toastmasters. So mm. we did a lot of traveling. So she was very well known on most of our airlines here in, in South Africa. Ah, so she Only was a celebrity in her own right. <laughs> Absolutely. They, 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 in Toastmasters, the, the highest education level you can get is called the DTM, mm -hmm. the Distinguished Toastmaster. And all of my guide dogs have affectionately been considered to be DTM, doggy Aww. Toastmasters. That's amazing. So, yeah, <laughs> it, it, they're just, they're so much part of my, my, my personality and my identity. Right. So, and as a speaker, they've become part of my brand. Right. They come with me up on stage and... I do think that often people spend more time watching the dog than they do listening to me speaking. <laughs> but you know what? I'm actually okay with that. Right. It's a part because of the Because if I experience. were in the audience, yeah, I'd be doing the same thing too. Yes. So, well, so that and that's, the that's so mm -hmm. amazing that they're able to, you know, be a part of that. Yes. And, and it, you know, when you're speaking about this, you know, disability and, and, 
such important topics around um, being able to do the things anyone else can do and having the guide dog right there to let them see that that's the purpose, that's their role. That's what they do for people with all types um, of reasons to have a service dog. Absolutely. In fact, I, as I mentioned in my, in my bio, I am also, I, I play some music sometimes. And I was playing in a show at our South African National Arts Festival. This was now two, three years ago. It was mm -hmm. before COVID, so it was probably three years ago. And they said to me, please bring Fiji with you. And I thought, <laughs> well, of course I'll bring Fiji with me. And then they said, and please take Fiji out on stage with you and tell us a little bit about guide dogs and, and what they do and how they help you. Problem is, I had no idea that my little beloved Fiji loves the limelight. Oh, no. <laughs> so while the performer before us in the show was on stage, I was sitting in the wings with a guide dog who was stamping her feet in excitement to get out onto stage. Oh, a star was born. Absolutely. And in fact, we've got some of it on video, which is really funny to see because we, we at the end when we did the, the bows and, and the, um, all the performers were acknowledged, I taught Fiji to bow her head as oh. we did as well. So it, it, was, it was quite, it was just a lot of fun to do. And it was so interesting to see that side of her as well. Right. So, to see her in yeah. such a different circumstance and, and how much yes. she loved it. That's amazing. So you mentioned that, well, Fiji wrote a book and you helped her. <laughs> so how did that come about? It started a number of years ago. I run a blog where I usually post once a week. Okay. And my, my blog is about disability awareness. It's about my speaking, about the books, about and just really about the things that I do. Mm -hmm. And about 2017, Fiji wrote her first blog. And it's landed up that she has written blogs now. She writes once a month. She does a guest blog on my blog. And she writes usually the first Tuesday of every month. Oh. And I was considering, after I finished my last book, which was a memoir called A Different Way of Seeing, I thought, what am I going to do next as a writing project? And I realized I had all of these blogs from Fiji talking about the world from her perspective. Mm -hmm. Because seeing the world through a dog's eyes, particularly a guide dog's eyes, it gives scope for a different perspective, a different way of seeing some of the issues yes. that we face as visually impaired people, but also just some of the things that we do. I mean, air travel from the perspective of a dog. Oh, yes. It's a totally different experience. You know, you go somewhere you hurry up from one place to another and then you wait right. a lot. <laughs> yes. And then you either climb on a bus and then climb up some steps into a big metal sausage or you walk down this metal ramp, which sounds echoey, and right. you get into the sausage that way. Then the sausage has indigestion. <laughs> and That's a sit. great way to think about it. You sit and you sit and you sit. Right. In seats that look like a theater, because she's been with me to the theater as well. Mm. It's just that less happens. Right. Than in a theater. And then the doors open and you get off and you're somewhere different. So being able to see what are fairly normal human experiences, but kind of see them from how I think Fiji might experience them. Right. It's, it was just so much fun to write. I'm sure that sounds amazing. And I think it's so, I mean, there's so many things we can learn from animals and their perspective on life. Yeah. But I would think in, in your situation specifically, you have Fiji because you're blind, but Fiji is your eyes. 
So obviously yeah. the two of you are going through these experiences together, but are experiencing them sensationally very differently. Yes. And I think there are times that Fiji looks at me and shakes her head and goes, my mom is just very strange. <laughs> and yeah. there are times that I look at my dog and shake my head and go, Fiji, my girl, sometimes I just do not understand you. <laughs> so that's part of it as well. Right. Absolutely. Um, but it's just been so much fun and it's been a delight to write her world, her experiences, and some of her naughtiness as well. Because mm -hmm. guided dogs are just dogs and they do have moments when they're naughty. Yes. So just to give you a sneak peek of a story of Fiji being perhaps not the ideal guide dog. <laughs> I live quite close to a river estuary. It's about um, 100 meters down the road. I'm afraid I don't know what that would be in um, imperial in, terms. Yeah. But it's about a five minute walk at most from here. And it's a big open grassy area and there's a, um, a river estuary. And of course there is bird life there, mm -hmm. lots of ducks. And when Fiji was still quite new, it was before COVID, as I said, she was very young. We took her for a run on the grass and Fiji caught sight of the ducks and hopped into the dam, the flare, <laughs> Into the river and started swimming out after the ducks who kind of oh looked at this goodness. blonde head coming towards them and just paddled in the opposite direction my husband saw Fiji going out and started calling her back and calling her back and she would not come back and he was worried that she would go too far out and not be able to get back right he really started panicking so he quickly removed his his um, t-shirt and his um, tackies jumped into the water and followed her we're going to have dogs barking just now because I'm just hearing the gate in the, in the distance uh, okay and at he, the other dog who was walking with them at the time it was Eccles the old retired guide dog and Emily oh. the golden retriever <laughs> that's Alex again yay they're home goes, dad's home dad's <laughs> yes. home and Emily at the time was about six years old. So Fiji was paddling furiously after the ducks. Craig was paddling furious, <laughs> furiously after Fiji. Emily jumped in. Oh my goodness. And started following them. And that barking is Ali, the other rescue who I haven't really mentioned yet. And eventually poor Eccles was just left. And she just, just I think she was the most sensible one. She said, they'll come back. <laughs> and Craig eventually reached Fiji, turned around, there was Emily. I don't actually know whether Fee Emily was trying to also go after the ducks. Or just following. Or her. just follow Craig and Fiji. Yes. yes. <laughs> so they all got home safely. That's amazing. Which is the most important thing. Yeah. And that's such a great story, but it is such an important thing for people to remember that no matter how well-trained a service dog is, a guide dog, a rescue dog, whatever it is that they do for a living, they're still a dog. They, yes. like you said, they need breaks. They need to have their time to play. And it's always great when you have other dogs in the house that they get to play with. And as we've heard the barking, I know you said your husband had <laughs> taken Fiji for a ride. That um, I know people with service dogs often have other members of their family spend quality time with the dog when they're off duty to give so that they have that relationship and they know they're the fun person. They're the person I get to do special things with. Yeah, ultimately, I am Fiji's person. Right. If she's ever concerned, if she's worried about something, if she wants something, she will come to me. But she knows that my husband is also very much part of her family right. and she's totally comfortable with him. They are running partners. They have been since Fiji was very young. Um, and, and they actually taught our other, our older rescue to run as well, which she'd never done before. That's great. 
so yeah they they learn from each other but they are all definitely part of one big pack one big family yes and it's it's often a bundle of paws and tails and and, <laughs> and wagging things i can so, imagine yeah it, it's just <laughs> glorious to be surrounded by that amount of, of puppy love it really is yeah it sounds like it well, I have to say, I can't wait to go um, order myself a copy of Fiji's book. It sounds like it's amazing. And I'll be so excited to share it with my nephew. He is an avid reader, and I'm sure he will enjoy it as well. Oh, so oh, I, uh-huh. I think that's such a great way to share, you know, your purpose and your advocacy for um, disabilities and things like that to be able to do it in the same thing we're learning and you're you're advocating for the use of service dogs and the role they play but also you know their pets their dogs they still have a very different experience in the world than the rest of us and that's just so amazing one of the things that i was it was very important to me to do was to share the book with the guide dogs association so they could read it before i published it Oh, and if there's great. anything that they were concerned about, they would let me know. And I'm really glad that, you know, they are that engaged and that involved and they care that much yeah. as well. And, you know, they, they said to me, the guide dogs aren't always, they're not little robots. Right. They, they do have personalities. And yes, sometimes they are naughty. Yes. But that's why it's a partnership. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, um, here in the States, I don't, I'll be honest, I don't know now what how the protocol and the process, but my husband, when he was young, um, both he and his sister actually raised puppies that w- became guide dogs. Mm-hmm. And so they lived with them and he took him, he had a dog, a, a yellow lab named Red and Red went everywhere with my husband to school, to the park, everything. And he became a guide dog for, um, for a man who lived up in Canada. And when it was time for Red to retire, they called my husband's family and said, would you like Red to come back and live with you for whatever amount of time he has left to live? Mm -hmm. So my great experience was I got to go with them. There's a guide dog school up in San Rafael, which is about five hours away from where I live in California. And we got to visit the school. And so when you talk about the training and being there, I have the visual because I saw the little rooms that you have that are like some tiny apartments that you, you know, live in the, with the dog and you start to learn about them and meet them. And we got to um, meet Red's handler and um, it was a very emotional experience as he said goodbye to his faithful companion. Mm-hmm. And then of course he was staying there to meet his new guide dog and to train with them. And um, I also, you know, it was great because then I also got to be a part of Red's life in the end. And he lived yeah. with them for several more years. And it was just really an amazing experience. So hearing it from your perspective is so amazing to me just because I had that little peek into the world. So, I, I, you know, it's just really amazing thing that we're able to do, that the dogs are able to do, honestly. <laughs> it really is. It, it's a, It's a team situation it really is and I think you know the 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 puppy walkers the people who do look after those dogs from when they're very young before they go into training that's a very special kind of person yes because you look after a pup while it goes through the house training phase the chewing phase (gasps) all the difficult parts just when it's getting to be a really well-behaved animal and is really looking becoming beautifully behaved you pass it on to somebody else. Right. And honestly, I, I honestly don't know how my husband did that. I would have never been able to as a child to do that because I had dogs and I was super attached to them. But, mm-hmm. you know, it, it when I met him and learned that about him, you know, as you said, that made me know what kind of man he is. And obviously he's a huge animal lover and takes, mm-hmm. he, we have all sorts of animals. He has tortoises and tarantulas and all sorts <laughs> of things. So, you know, and and it was emotional for him. Um, I don't know if he would say that, but, you know, seeing Red again after all that time and Mm -hmm. and getting to spend that time with him in the end. Um, But I do have another funny story. His sister had a German shepherd that she was Mm -hmm. handling and training Mm -hmm. named Hexie. 
She was a beautiful dog, um, but not the sharpest. And um, they soon realized that she didn't know that she would have to lead a person around furniture. She had a tendency to jump over couches. <laughs> So unfortunately, Hexie did not make it through the training program. And I think it's important for no, some, sometimes that happens. Not every dog, no matter their breed and what they're, you think is going to work, works out. So instead of becoming a guide dog, she became the family pet. And so I knew Hexie as well when I met my husband, first met my husband. And, you know, it was really, she was a part of their family because it just didn't, she didn't click with that type of lifestyle. And, and she was much more accustomed to just being the family dog. And you know, I, I, I think you're right. I, I think in South Africa, there's about a 70% success rate okay. with the training, but there are a number of dogs that work through the training program and don't become service animals for one or other reason. It could be that they are scared of car travel. Right. It could be we had one recently that was allergic to grass oh my that he he or she i can't even remember i didn't i did meet the dog but um the allergies just became such a huge problem and yes i think you know i i'm very fortunate that when my dogs retire i have a freestanding home with a big enough yard yes. that the dogs can stay with me and I'm I'm really glad about that. I would hate to have to say goodbye yes. to to one of my pups um, because they're retiring. Yeah, because I'm that sure that would so be strong. very they difficult. So much part of the family. Absolutely. But I also know that in you know through two and a half three years when Fiji retires, it's going to be a tough experience for both her and me, because I promise you, when I pick up that harness or her leash. She runs around as if she's just, it's the most joyful time of the day. Mm. She so loves to work. That's amazing. And hopefully by the time she is a little bit older and is getting ready to retire, she won't feel as strongly about it. But I don't know how realistic that hope is. But right. We'll, we'll have to navigate that as and when we have to deal with it. But right. Right. Yeah. Amazing. So you've mentioned your other three and we've heard them speak. Um, we, we don't have a we don't have a, someone to let us know what they were saying. We have a good idea. So you have three other dogs, um, Emily, Allie and Onyx. Yes. So how did you come to bring them into your pack? Emily is a 12 year old golden retriever. OK. And she joined our family. One of my husband's colleagues had a golden retriever that had puppies. And at the time, my husband and I agreed that we were definitely not getting a puppy. Hmm. And then one day my husband came home from work and he said, <laughs> what do you think about the name Emily? And I said, for a puppy that we're not going to get, I think it's a lovely name. <laughs> and that's where we left it. And a few weeks after that, it was coming towards the end of the year. So the Christmas functions were happening. And my husband had a Christmas function that he went to. It was during the daytime. And he gave me a call from the Christmas function. And he started off by saying, I want you to know that I am okay. Uh-oh. <laughs> like, okay. Because, but I have been thinking. I've never actually really had a puppy. So do you think we could actually get one of the retrievers? And that's how we got Emily. <laughs> ah. <laughs> and Emily came into our house as a nine-week-old little bundle of golden fur. Oh, wow. And she was all teeth, fur, and wags. <laughs> I can My, picture that. <laughs> yeah. So she did try to chew things. She chewed our entire lounge suite. 
not just the material off the top, but the padding underneath and the mm. wooden frame underneath that. <laughs> she chewed slippers. She still loves pulling the the um, the covers off tennis balls oh, and then yes. breaking them in half. <laughs> she also, as a very young pup, did some extraordinarily unusual and funny things. So our main bedroom, the bed is a little bit higher off the ground than normal, and she was only a tiny puppy. You, know, you forget with a a, a fully grown retriever you forget how small they are when they're babies yes they are and she couldn't reach to the top of the bed but she would put her one front paw up and then the other front paw up then one of the back paws up and this is where you could see she was a puppy she would then lift the final back paw and wonder why she landed up in a huddle on the ground <laughs> She also, because at this stage, my six-year-old um, guide dog, Eccles, decided playing with a puppy 24-7 was definitely not on her job description. <laughs> so she relocated <laughs> herself to under the bed. Oh, okay. And the puppy believed that she couldn't go under there because she was clearly too big to follow after her much bigger and older <laughs> new sister. So funny. And it's so funny because I, I always say I'm a dog sitter. So I, I mm -hmm. work with a variety of dogs and the smaller they are, the bigger they think they are. Yes. <laughs> but I think the funniest thing that Emily ever did as a puppy, she used to blow bubbles in her water bowl. My goodness. I've never known another dog who does that. Yes, I haven't. And my either. husband, believe me, he's like, she blows bubbles. No, you must be imagining. It must be something else. And then one day he was watching while she was drinking and she started blowing bubbles. You're absolutely right. So that was Emily. And <laughs> she's still with us. She's 12 going on 13. She's still playful. She's still loving. She still loves her food. Um, she's went through a stage when she was very young where she didn't like change. Oh, okay. So when we bought a new refrigerator, she barked at it, even though that's where she ate her food. And she would start, put her nose into her bowl and start eating and then catch sight of the fridge, lift her head and growl at it. And then remember her food and repeat the process. That's so, so funny. She's become a little more used to change now. So she's adapting a lot quicker. And, but she's still, she's just a beautiful natured dog. And she loves nothing better than sitting with us at supper time, hooking her front paw over somebody's leg, just mm. over their foot. And then she's grounded and she knows she's with her people. So yes. that's Ems. Then she Ali is... The youngest of the dogs, but she's been with us longer than Onyx. Okay. When we went to, she, she comes from a, a rescue organization called Tears, the Anna, Emily Animal Rescue. Mm. And when we went there, we said, we are looking for a small, short-haired female dog. And we went and we met a couple of the dogs. And my husband saw this dog and she said, there's a cross Labrador. And I said, but we're looking for a small dog. I said, I know, I know. But there's a Labrador cross and, and, and she's beautiful. So we eventually met Ali and she ran up to my husband, flipped onto her back and wanted to play. Hmm. And that particular rescue organization, they knew we, they asked, you know, do you have other dogs? We said, yes. They asked us to bring the other dogs with us so that the dogs could meet in neutral territory to see how they would get on. And I just loved that process. Yes, I think that's great. And Ali initially was a little bit snappish with our, the, 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 the two girls that we had at the time. And it was a 
you know, she was found as a 13 month old on a, a construction site. Mm -hmm. And she was quite skittish. She still, even after two to three years, is still quite skittish to loud noises or sudden movement. We, she just disappears. It's like, oh, it's Ali gone. Mm. But she's adapted incredibly well. And now that snappiness has actually become part of her play. Oh. So I, I, when we got her, so the, the, we, we, you know, we said she's a Labrador cross because that's what she looked like. Mm -hmm. But then when we got her, we realized she loved running and she was incredibly fast. And my husband said, well, maybe she's got Whippet or Irish Greyhound or something like that. Mm -hmm. And eventually we decided to do a doggy DNA test just oh, because we're curious. Right. That's great. But by then we had decided that she was probably half Labrador, half Whippet, half crocodile because of the snappy jaws thing, <laughs> half springbok, which is a South African buck that does vertical liftoffs because that's what Ali does. Oh, she's yes. excited. She doesn't run. She bounces. And half Wookiee, like Chewbacca oh. from Star Wars. Yes. Because she speaks Wookiee. Oh, I can I can imagine it. Yeah. And of course, all those halves make up to way more than one, but that was the right. material. When we got the results of the doggy DNA test back, we discovered she's actually about 70% German Shepherd. Oh. About 25% Rhodesian Ridgeback. But she's very pale blonde. She doesn't have a ridge. Her eyes and her body shape is quite shepherd. Mm -hmm. But her fur and Ali has the longest tail of any dog I've ever met. Oh, if she's that's standing straight, she can tickle herself on the nose. Oh, my without, goodness. Without twisting her body. She's the one dog who, honestly, there is absolutely no fun in chasing her tail. She just has to flip it around her body. And, and right there it is. The nose. <laughs> yes. It's amazing. But the, you know, she's, she's just really adapted. In fact, we have always had a rule in the house, no dogs on the furniture. Mm -hmm. When Ali moved in, that rule went out the window. <laughs> so now all the dogs are allowed on the furniture, except not the bed. And they actually respect that. We're still having a few moments with Onyx where mm. he forgets that rule. <laughs> but couches, that's absolutely fine. And I can Ali just imagine a couch full of all of the dogs. They don't all fit. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, sorry, there's no room for you. Yes. Um, definitely no room for the humans. That's why we sit other where, you know, elsewhere in, in, in the room. Yes. But Ellie loves to run. She's playful. She's not much of a toy, uh, dog toy kind of dog. Mm -hmm. But every now and then, you know, she prefers playing with her siblings. Um, so she and particularly Onyx at the moment, because they're about the same age. They play rough and tumble. We sometimes go into the lounge and the furniture's moved. Or, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's quite, it, it becomes quite something. In fact, yes. there was a game going on just now. My husband shut the door so that it wouldn't intrude. <laughs> they get and, a little rambunctious. Oh, yes. Um, and, and occasionally we have yips and ouches and, Ali was playing outside. This is probably around the time that lockdown started. So just at the start of COVID. And she was running around the property outside. And she took a turn, but she didn't take the turn very well. Mm. And we just heard a thump against our wall to the next door neighbor's home. And she came in kind of a little bleary eyed and she had cut herself under one of her eyes. Oh, no. We've got the most amazing vet. So we dropped him an SMS and said, 
this has happened. Do we need to bring her in? And uh, this is now at about eight o'clock at night. And he said, it looks like it should be okay, but bring her in tomorrow morning. And he get, you know, told us what to do to just check that she was okay. She, I don't think she even realized that she'd hurt herself because oh. she's just so focused on play. But yeah, that was a little bit scary. Just hearing that thud against the wall was quite something. I can imagine. It's so scary. It is scary. But she came running into the house and it was quite clear that she was okay. Right. But just with this little cut and we, we cleaned her up and tried to get her to calm down a little bit. But she was back out in the garden running around almost immediately because, well, that's just Ali. Yeah. <laughs> and then our fourth member of our family is Onyx, who, as I say, we've had about a year. And Onyx is partially sighted. Okay. And he was picked up by the another of the, the rescue organizations here in, in Cape Town called DARG, the Domestic Animal Rescue Group. He was picked up as a very young puppy wandering around living in a fishing village, mm. which is close to Cape Town. And they were worried because they could realize his eyesight wasn't good. And they were worried that he would fall into the harbor and drown. Oh. So he pretty much grew up at Dog. He was there for about five years. Oh, wow. And he, there were a lot of people who were interested in him. Mm -hmm. And as soon as the, the people at Dog said, you do need to bear in mind that he is partially sighted. Then there was this kind of, oh, we're not sure we can actually adjust with it. We, we don't know that we'd be the right people to look after him. So he lived there until um, he was about five. And then we came into contact with um, this picture of Onyx. It was on Facebook. And my husband, again, fell in love with this little dog. Does, uh, does, do you notice how often my husband's name comes up in this conversation? I do. Around getting dogs. It sounds never... like what my husband would say about me and all the cats we get. <laughs> I've, I have yet to say no. I will say that much. But definitely the, the instigator is my husband. And he said, can we at least meet the dog? And totally different adoption process, but also really good. So Craig went and he met Onyx first and totally fell in love with the dog. And the dog totally fell in love with my husband. And that's of something course. that is still very true. And then they said, well, you've got three dogs already all females and now you want to bring a male into the house let's just introduce them slowly so the some of the volunteers from dog and some of the or one of the employees i think and an animal behavioralist brought Do um, onyx to visit and because he's partially sighted because he's never really lived in a home environment right Suddenly being surrounded by three bonded, enthusiastic, wagging, but quite excited dogs, Onyx became very defensive. So he said, okay, we need to take this quite slowly. And he came and visited several times. He went for walks with each of our dogs to get them accustomed to each other. And then he came to stay he had a play date so he stayed a day with us and then eventually they said okay we're, we're comfortable with how he seems to be fitting in so you know if you're happy we're happy and then they foster the dogs first and right. only after three weeks do they actually finalize the adoption as yes. as with Ali there was a foster period as well and I, I quite like that because yes it is a it's a it is a commitment yes. and if it doesn't work out it's a commitment or so quite a change to, to shift things around. Right. So, yeah, he's been with us about a year. And he's still quite territorial. Yeah. So every now and then he kind of goes, my kitchen, <laughs> my dad, yes, my attention, and definitely my food. But it's 
generally been fine. And the, the main reason that he adjusted, because that first few weeks, he was very withdrawn. And he just sat on the couch and didn't really want to engage with the other dogs. And this is where Ali became so phenomenally amazing. Because she would nudge at him and she would go and say, come and play, come and play. And she would Aww. keep pushing. But if he kind of went, I do not want to play, she would back off. That's and it was really fascinating seeing the two rescues. Right. How Ali, who'd been here for a year or two already, drew him into the family. And they really are best buddies. And this is why they play all the time. Mm -hmm. But it was so amazing just watching the EQ. Right. That Emily, sh Ali showed. I mean, it was Ali, not Emily. In helping Onyx to adjust, to integrate, and really to become one of the family. It was just eye-opening to really see that. Happen. That's beautiful. You know, it was. It, just like when animals choose their person, sometimes they mm -hmm. choose their, their best friend. And that's yeah. their person, especially if they think they're in need and they can see that they, you know, need some help. Um, that's just really beautiful. And, and I think sometimes with them both being rescues, it's like, you know, it's almost like she understands him more than yeah. maybe other dogs. She's like, I've been there. It's okay. It's new. Or it's going to be good for you. I, so, I know it's, I know it's strange right now, but right. just give it a chance. Yes. Yeah. That's amazing. It's so, well, your, your family just sounds so incredible. What, what a, an amazing pack that you have and the way that they love each other and they love you yeah. and your husband and you know with all of them with their different personalities and their different roles in the family it just really sounds like an amazing well we, um, we really do engage with them a lot I mean right. they are um, around I you know where, where I am in this room now this is where I usually work and I usually have Emily sitting on the the dog blanket on the side of the room and Ellie often comes and curls up at my feet or with her head on my lap. And then she wanders off to go and check what my husband's doing. Or, right. you know, they, they, they really are. And each one is a uniquely different personality. Yes. But I can't, I can't tell you how many times we've landed up laughing just completely uncontrollably because they just cause so much joy and they live with such joy. Yes. And I think that's one of the things that I love about animals is they, they're just, they're non-judgmental. Yes. And they just. They give unconditional they approach, love. They do, but I think they also approach the world with a wide-eyed sense of wonder and excitement. And I think yes. if we could learn that as humans. Absolutely. That would make things a whole lot better. And there's such great examples that, you know, even talking about Onyx, every, what he'd been through and in the environment he'd lived in and all and having his own um limited sight you know it didn't stop him from becoming right. a part of your family and you know being able to be an important role for the other dogs as well so it's so important and i have to say you talking about how long onyx was at the was at the rescue mm -hmm. is an important thing to note because um oftentimes people um shy away from adopting an animal that may have some type of disability like limited vision or blind or maybe is missing one of their legs but it's so important to realize just like people they're still perfect and um i follow some amazing blind dogs that are therapy dogs and mm -hmm. you know watching them navigate their environment they you know they do it just fine they probably do it better than i would <laughs> <laughs> it, it was one of the things with Onyx that we we noticed quite early. He walks slightly differently. He walks with his front paws almost forwards, mm. as if he's feeling in front of himself. And he knows our, our property incredibly well now. Right. So he he kind of knows where to turn and things like that. But he navigates around the yard using the walls and mm. um, different I identifiable points right. to follow. And it's been quite interesting watching that. And you can also see we have one step up 
from the, the front yard <clears throat> into an open area um, in front of our, our front door. And he knows to slow down a little bit, not a lot, but enough so that he can prepare to find that step and navigate that safely. When right. he comes in through the front door, he often slows down and just either uses an audio cue, because I, I, I give him a lot of audio cues if, if I'm, because I'm blind, he's partially sighted, and we have right. bumped into each other every now yeah. and then. He has bumped into other things as well, but not right. you know, significantly so. But it just helps him to navigate right. the space that he's in. So just like me, exactly. he's using his other senses to help him. And I think right. that was, you know, we said, we're not scared of having a partially sighted dog right. because we're already ex living that experience. Yes. So it was That's a, amazing. And so you were yeah. able to, you know, know what he needed more so than someone else, but also have a family that's accepting and would spend the time to allow him to get used to the environment and become comfortable and have what he needed. Well, it must have been totally overwhelming for him when he first moved in. And I can understand oh, yeah. why he kind of withdrew as, as he did. And I'm just really glad that Ali played him out of that. Yes. Encouraged him and supported him out of it. Yeah. So, so amazing. Dogs, uh, animals in general, but dogs. I don't know how anyone lives without them. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you so much, Lois, for being here. Um, I've learned so much from everything you've spoken about, and it's just amazing to hear from your perspective of having a guide dog and, and the different dogs you've had, as well as your other dogs, your entire family, and how they all, you know, get along together and their amazing different personalities. It's just really Oh, it's just refreshing to hear such a beautiful family and how you've been able to rescue dogs and, and add them to your, your pack and really do what you can for them in any way possible. It's been lovely to have the opportunity to share a little bit of our story with you as well. Yes. And listeners, as I said in the beginning, I will, um, in the description of this episode, you will find all of your information um, about Lois and following her and learning more about her books and her podcast and her blog, as well as um, the organization she mentioned, the South African Guide Dog Association. They do have an Instagram and a Facebook that I will post along with the, um, the episode that so you can check them out and learn more about it. Thank you so much again, Lois. I really appreciated you been, being here. It was really, really a, a great conversation to have. Well, thanks so much, Julie. I really enjoyed being with you as well. Thank you. Thank you for listening to episode five of the Story of My Pet podcast. A very special thanks to my guest, Lois Strachan. It was wonderful hearing about her life and the role guide dogs have played for her independence and as a crucial part of her family. You can follow Lois on Facebook to learn more about her work as a speaker and disability advocate, as well as all of her books. All of Lois's guide dogs were made possible by the work of the South African Guide Dogs Association for the Blind. To learn more about them and their work, visit their website or follow them on Instagram and Facebook. As always, you can follow along this podcasting journey on Instagram at the story of my pet podcast. Learn more about upcoming episodes, special announcements, and join our email list or sign up to be a guest on a future episode. All links are in the episode description. Have a great day and thanks again for listening.